And you know where we need to go? Where do we need to yeah, go? Not the Southwest board, mm -hmm. the Southwest, the big board, Southwest board. Yeah. It's important if we need to know what's happening economically. I wonder. But this morning, this is like, wearing an, it's like an Avengers thing. His blue suede shoes. Yeah, I'm sure he is. Joining has. us now from the big board, NBC News National See, that's Political good. Correspondent. You're kind of getting into Steve the Karnacki. whole Elvis, the pelvis Steve, thing. Steve, help us out here. Please Take it help. away from us now. <laughs> Hey, they had the Elvis movie last year. Maybe it's revived interest. Maybe the Presley campaign yeah. thinks there's something uh, there's something in that. But um, let's go through here what we're looking at today here. You mentioned you teed up the big ones. Look, Ohio, there are actually two initiatives on the ballot there. One's that constitutional amendment. It would say abortion is legal in the state constitution. It would also provide a provision for restrictions after the point of fetal viability, about 24 weeks. The second one involves the legalization of recreational marijuana. Marijuana. And then, as you mentioned, in Virginia, they have that split legislature right now where the Republicans have the House of Delegates, the Democrats have the state Senate. Glenn Youngkin, the Republican governor, very much wants both of them. Abortion has been an issue there as well, with Youngkin pushing what he thinks is sort of nationally a compromised position that could help Republicans on this issue with moderate voters. He's saying abortion with a limit at 15 weeks. That's where he would set the cutoff. And Democrats have been saying that's too much. That's too extreme. It's been a major part of the campaigning in Virginia. They spent huge money on it. Just to give you a sense of where expectations are, this is the abortion ballot question in Ohio. This is the most recent polling. It's favored by 5735 in this polling. Should mention that every statewide ballot initiative, either those advanced by the pro-choice side or those advanced by the pro-life side, since Roe v. Wade was overturned a little more than a year ago, they none of them have gone in favor of the pro-life side. So that is the history that the opponents of this are up against today. There was also a bit of a test vote in Ohio this summer where opponents of this ballot initiative put something on the ballot this summer that they hoped would preempt this. It, on the ballot, they proposed raising the threshold for a constitutional amendment to needing 60% support, not 50% simple majority uh, in order to pass. That went down to defeat this summer, and a lot of folks think that was a test vote, a proxy vote, if you will, for what we're going to see today. But we'll find out tonight uh, in, in Ohio. Again, the balance in Virginia right now, Republicans with the control of the House of Delega uh, Delegates, Democrats with control of the state Senate. Youngkin wants to have both along with the governorship. And there is some talk. You know, take it with an enormous grain of salt that Youngkin has presidential aspirations and might still somehow make some kind of late entry into the 24 Republican race. Ballot deadlines have passed in some states. It's hard to see, but the talk still exists in some corners, so keep that in mind, too. Now, Kentucky, the governor's race, you mentioned Bashir, the Democrat running for re-election, Daniel Cameron, the Republican attorney general, the protege of Mitch McConnell, is challenging him. Perspective on this? Four years ago, when Bashir won the governorship, this is what it looked like. He had unseated a Republican incumbent, Matt Bevin, who was deeply unpopular in Kentucky. And I just draw your attention to the margin. Even up against a Republican as unpopular as Bevin was, Bashir won, but he won by barely 5,000 votes. Now, he's polled well in terms of job approval, in terms of folks liking him personally, but there's been some late polling in this campaign that suggested it's tightened in the last week or two, so it could be very close. Uh, where I'm looking tonight, I'll just tell you, this is a state in the presidential election. We all know it's a very red state. There's 120 counties in the state. Joe Biden won a grand total of two of them. It's where Louisville is and where Lexington is uh, in 2020. But you look at the blue counties here that Bashir was able to win, and a couple are very interesting. You know, you've got four right here, sort of in eastern coal country. You know, this was once once upon a time, going way back at least a generation or two, a core Democratic area. Now you're talking about counties that typically have been giving Donald Trump, you know, 70, 75 percent of the vote. Bashir was actually able to win a bunch of them over here in the eastern coal country on the western side here. Again, he was able to win some counties that Democrats don't typically win. Uh, he was able to expand the Democratic footprint in the Lexington-Frankfurt area. And there's a lot of people up here. These three counties just outside Cincinnati, a lot, of, uh, a lot of the population is up here, too. 
Trump won all three of these counties. Bashir flipped two of them. So it's the big question as the results come in tonight. Bashir really needs every single one of these counties that turned blue in 2019 to stay blue, ideally for him to expand margins, to add more blue. If you, if you see tonight any of the blue counties from 2019 flip red, that is bad news for the governor because, as we said, his margin for error from 2019 is so slim. It really is. Uh, Caddy, uh, let, let's talk really quickly. I want you to jump in and uh, ask Steve a question. But first of all, let, let's talk about Ohio for a second. Here is a really red state. Donald Trump won it comfortably. It's been trending more and more Republican, more and more conservative uh, over the past six, seven, eight years. And yet you see that abortion number, yeah. uh, 22 point difference. Uh, basically uh, passing a statewide amendment that would pretty much enact what the law was under Roe v. Wade. Yeah, I mean, Ohio doing what Kansas did and bucking the kind of national political trends, bucking the statewide political trends when it comes to this specific issue of abortion. And when you look at that New York Times poll, dig into it a little deeper beyond the kind of very gloomy headlines for Democrats. And still on this issue of abortion, Joe Biden outperforms Republican. He's a Republican challenger uh, by large margins. So it's still very much a motivating issue for Democrats. And, and Steve, you know, Given that, um, Larry Sabato was on the show yesterday and said something interesting about, he was talking about the Virginia race, but you can tie it into the others too, that sometimes these off-year elections tell us a lot. These special elections can tell us a lot about a future presidential election, and sometimes they don't necessarily. Kind of in the context of history, how do we know whether today's results in Ohio, in Kentucky, in Virginia in particular, are going to tell us a lot about the 2024 general election in a year's time, or maybe not? Yeah, I, I'm not sure they're going to tell us a lot. It, it's maybe more that they give us some clues to ponder over in, in, in two particular ways. One in these two governor's races, it, we didn't mention before, but Tate Reeves, uh, he, look, this is how Tate Reeves, the Republican incumbent, got elected in 2019 in Mississippi. You know, state Donald Trump won by 16 points. It was only five points in the governor's race when Reeves won the first time. And he's been an unpopular governor. There's been a welfare scandal there. There's an issue of payments to Brett Favre, the former NFL quarterback. We mentioned Brandon Presley. He's run on a lot of conservative themes. He certainly sort of opened, a, offered a bridge to Republican-friendly voters to come and vote for him in this election. What Reeves is really relying on in Mississippi and for that matter, what Daniel Cameron, the Republican, is really relying on in Kentucky is that these are red states where the antipathy towards Joe Biden and the national Democratic brand is so strong and so animating, even among sort of softer Republican voters that ultimately, even faced with Democratic candidates they kind of like and they kind of have common ground with mm -hmm. on some issues. And Republicans, in the case of Reeves, they don't necessarily like the party is going to override the personality. And if that happens in both of those states, that's a sign that would be a little, I think, concerning for Democrats heading into 24. And that would be, you know, for Republicans, a sign of hope for them, you know, again, because it would yeah. just be a measure of the intensity of that feeling. And the other question then is on abortion, obviously, uh, in Virginia in particular, Democrats have made such an issue of this 15-week ban. Youngkin, on the other hand, thinks 15 weeks that's sort of the sweet spot in public opinion for Republicans. Youngkin thinks he's creating a model for Republicans to use nationally in 2024. If Republicans have success tonight, I think that idea of a 15-week limit, you're going to start seeing in a lot of other places.